Hey folks, welcome back to The Pulse. It is one o'clock Central Texas time and it is so good to see you again for another Friday episode. This is number 19 with Steve Staggs. 19. Isn't this crazy? We're going to have almost 40 hours of content of a couple of old dudes yakking, which I think is fantastic content. I, uh, I'm i looking forward to when I'm an old and crusty old man telling my grandkids hey watch the stuff that we recorded back in 2023 but uh, i'm glad that you're here live um we got some really cool stuff to talk about today because um these are consequential times we're living in a really unique crisis era we're living in a time where so many things are changing and you know i don't know if you have the senses that i do that there's meaning and purpose in all of this and I met Steve Staggs at a Texan meetup. He came, a friend of his brought him. I didn't even know who he was. And I get to meet this guy who's a per former professional baseball player. I meet him and I'm like, the Lord says to me, hey, pay attention to this guy. I'm like, okay. So we became fast friends. And, you know, we've talked for like the last eight months. Um, and we decided, you know, let's do this together together in public let's do this uh, as a live stream and record this stuff and so a lot of this stuff is stream of consciousness but other you know we talk about in advance just what the lord is doing and leading and how does this all fit together um, because there's order to all of creation and one of the things you'll hear steve say so many times is the fact that once you see it you can't unsee it and he also says you know what it's amazingly simple when it's kind of all when you kind of figure it all out. And I think that that's one of the things that is the evidence for me of that we're on the right track is that this is not some complicated thing that you have to have a slide rule to figure out. It's no, this is the order. And what happens when things get ordered in your life? Well, what's the result? Well, for me, it's a piece that transcends all understanding and you have rest. And what do we have in the world right now? Everyone worried, anxious, concerned, scared, fear, right? So we talk about all those things. So welcome back. Let's bring in Steve, the main attraction. He's beardless. What's up, Steve? You're on mute. You're on mute, my friend. Get off of mute. There you go, somehow. There, we'll get you off of mute. There, there he is. How's Yay. that? Much yeah, better. Much we're better. back. Yeah, you're looking sharp, man. Well, thank you, man. It's amazing what Gillette will do for you. Yeah, it's amazing. It's like you can lose 10 pounds with one shave. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is it is so good to see you. This is episode number 19. And I am just thrilled because I always, you know, these these times with you, um, I always feel and I'm expecting to have some new understanding of things. And a lot of times we review stuff we've talked about, but I see it in a new way. And that's yeah. something that I think is is fantastic. We've got some friends here, and I know we want to update on Mike as well. So Sam Kemp, who's been a great friend to Mike, um, is saying hello. Good afternoon to you. Sam Kemp, Academaciated, back again. Taryn, hello, hello. Mm -hmm. Finn Bear, all the way from Finland. You know, he is a master woodworker. I don't know if you know this, but no, Finn Bear is, yeah, he's a craftsman. Mm -hmm. um david lee all the way from southwestern indiana is here hex glenn is here hexonium so fantastic david lee's excited to see you as well 
he gets a, a ton from all of this. He and I mm-hmm. chat about these as well. Um, so I'm really curious, you know, you've talked about, we talked about a lot of things this last episode about freedom and sovereignty. We talked about a new economic order. I just did a video uh, yesterday about new money and really kind of incorporating these things. And then, you know, I see this, the fruit of all of this practice in seeing things in a new way. Yeah. And I, I'd love for you just, you know, what's the, what's on your mind today? What's on, what's on your heart and what do you feel like is, um, is important that people understand? Cause you've been kind of, you're kind of a filter for me of all of the things that are kind of swirling around in our community in, um, and in the world. Yeah. Um, probably the, the one thing other than what we've already talked about and, and inviting people to say, okay, Jesus, what do you say about all this? Are you the real deal or you just some figment of some very clever guy's imagination? Yeah. Um, but in addition to that or in concert with that, I would say learning, learning to think again. We don't, we don't know how to think anymore. We're told what to think. We are... The things to think about are pre-fashioned, pre-manufactured for us. Um, we don't know how to think anymore. We don't know how to, to look at something and say, uh, is that, you know, is that really right? What, what is going on there? And then learn how to ask the questions that start peeling the layers of the onion back. Um, we don't know how to do that. Now, in times past and, you know, in the university level and college, you know, they might have called it critical thinking and stuff like that. And yeah, there's an aspect of that. But it's, it's recognizing that whatever is, whatever is seen is visible. Now, that might sound like, oh, yeah, obvious. No, if you see it, it has all the elements of becoming visible at its most basic fundamental level. It just requires us to sit back and say, okay, I'm not taking you at first glance. I'm not accepting what you're presenting to me. What I'm going to do is I'm going to now start probing to find out who you really are. And what you discover when you, when you start learning how to do that and incorporating it as part of your, your life, I'm not talking about being suspicious in nature. I'm talking about being one who is pursuing what is true and not accepting something as true just because it says it is. And one of the things that you you learn, at least I've learned that I pass on to you and others, is that when you do that, what you soon discover is what is true is invites you, when something is true, it invites you to probe more and deeper. If it is not true, it will instantly start putting up barriers to keep you from probing any further. Mm. And they're very clever in how they do it. Okay. Ranging from, oh, it's obvious. What are you talking about? Oh, you're a dummy? Of course you know what's in you. you know. But the point is there are lo- what I call lines of defenses that are put in place that keep you from probing further or distract you from what the objective of your probe actually is. When something is true, truth doesn't do that. You know, truth invites you to probe deeper because it is waiting for you to discover something that is true. Now, in the in the context of, of Jesus in the New Testament that we've talked about and referred to the scriptures often, Jesus says, hey, if if you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine and you will learn the truth and the truth will set you free. Why? 
because there is in in what the things that are truth the truth is a liberating element when something is true it has no it has no corrupt elements in it the truth has no corrupt elements in it and so what is not corrupted is free to exhibit, express, and fulfill what it was designed to do. There are no encumbrances. So what is true, what is the truth, invites you to probe deeper because the deeper you go, the freer you become. And the more it true becomes, it becomes. That's right. You go, oh, yeah, that's true. Oh, what? And by the way, we know that. And through our own experience, somebody comes and tries to sell us a bill of goods and we know it's different. Guess what? We just don't buy it. Nah, I know the truth. And that what you're talking to me isn't the truth. That's a bunch of garbage. What is it? You are free. You are unencumbered. You are not compelled. There is a liberty that is present because you know the truth. That's a really interesting concept. You know that um, that guy, Oliver Anthony, who sang that song? Yes. It's interesting how much this idea of truth is so true and widespread. So, for example, truth in authenticity. Yes. One of the things I recognized with, you know, you may not be a country music fan, and there's so many people who commented upon that song. But it's true with YouTubers. It's true with anyone that you meet is that this idea of authenticity. Well, what is something that's authentic, but it's something that is true. Yeah. And we know so often, you know, I, I go back to the garden and I think about this idea of knowing that you're naked, right? So prior to, prior to this time, there was no differences, right? There was nothing that was pointed out. And of course, someone asked me years ago, they said, what parts did they cover? And I, I was like, that's an interesting question. What parts did they cover? Well, they covered what was different about them. They didn't cover their hands or their wrists or their ankles or their knees. They covered the things that were different. And what do we do? And it's such a picture of what we do, right? We take the things that we're ashamed of and we cover them. And so we are either hiding or disclosing the truth or we are misrepresenting the truth. And there's something inherent in that that we sometimes can discern and it's interesting that concept of what is true and what's not and how attracted we are naturally to the truth and some people have even described it as it has a resonance to it yeah. the truth just rings it rings true well i think that's you know kind of that song right and to find somebody who's saying this is authentically true for this person when he's singing this song and it captures something. And what is it about it that captures something in me? Why is there an emotional reaction? Because I go, you just put into words and song something that I recognize as true. Yeah. Yeah. Powerful. It, it's, it is very powerful. Um, and we've, we've lost the, the skill. We have the attributes to do it, but we have lost the skill because we, we um, in, in the vocabulary that describes it for me is because we have, we have aligned ourselves with causes above what is true. And so we, there is something that we're, there's a cause, there's an injustice, there is a justice, there's this, that, or the other thing that we pursue and give ourselves to. And what we don't realize is we, we haven't paused to say, wait a minute, is this thing that I'm pursuing, that I have found myself, you know, with my passions being ignited to get you know, behind this thing, have I ever, have I even just stopped and paused and say, okay, let's look at this thing a little closer. You know, is this, and when, when we don't do that, what we don't realize is, you know, these things change so very gradually that by the time we get plugged in, 
those things that have been distorted over centuries, we just accept as true anymore. Yeah. You know, and we've talked about them in the context of, you know, our the vocabulary we hear being used to describe our rights in the Constitution that is then it is now in the common era described as the guarantor of our rights. Folks, no, no, no. See that when you pause and you look at that, you say, wait a minute, the Constitution is a created document. Are you now telling me that the ones who created it are inferior to the thing that was created by them? That's not how it works. The only way it works is when those who learn to use it as a mechanism of exploitation get us to agree with the vocabulary that they have begun to incorporate about something that we agree to subordinate ourselves to. Well, no, that's not how it works. Our, our agreement is conditional. Agreement is not absolute. We created the document. There's nothing wrong with the document. It is neutral. What is wrong are though there are those who are exploiting the document in order to rule. It is true that they are exploiting to rule. The truth is that they are perverse. And now you deal with the perversion. You expel the perversion. And, and when it comes to, to our country in particular, there, there is a means for doing that. The superior people who are sovereign over the document have set up a mechanism to purge the perversion. How do you know there's perversion? By looking at the lengths to which the perverts are protecting their position of exploitation. We call it power. See? They're not inviting further. They're not right. inviting. They're not saying, oh no, come up. No, they're not inviting at all. They are repelling. They're their lines of defenses are up and there are all kinds of ways that they are doing that. Well, why am I even bringing that up? Because I got some political agenda? No, because it's a practical application, a practical um, demonstration of what it is to pause, think about something, probe to see what is there, and then understanding your position in standing related to that thing. And now what are your options? What can you do about it? Are you going to roll over and play dead? Or are you going to stand up and say, no, no, that's not how it works. You know, no, the Constitution does not guarantee our rights. That's not what it was designed to do. How can an inalienable right be guaranteed by a document? See? The very nature of being inalienable, inalienable is superior to whatever can be transcribed on a, on a document, on a piece of paper. Okay. So, okay, we got to think about that. Well, what does that actually mean? Well, then start fashioning, allowing your life to be fashioned around the truth of something. Because when you do that, all of a sudden, hmm, you start identifying and living in this thing called liberty and the truth shall sh shall set you free you know there's a whole movie about that by the way you know uh, the game remember me oh, sharing man. two episodes back you know in the 70s i'm assuming the 70s in the uh, early 90s um how jesus you know recruited me to in this context of prayer Yep. You know, exchanging wishes, you know. Uh, we're going to take over the bully pulpit, Satan's bully pulpit in the theater. And um, 
we're going to start sharing with folks the real deal, the truth. And over a period of about 15 years, there were, especially in the first five to seven years, there was one movie after another that came out that was in parable form, but it was telling you exactly what the kingdom of God is about. You know, and the game is, hey, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Well, what happened? He found out what the truth was. And yep. what did he do? Set him free. Yep. See? So it's everywhere, you know, in life, if we just learn how to recapture that ability to look at something um, and learn to probe for what is true. Now, in the in the let's say in the context of that, so let's dive into this this idea. Obviously, there are those who want to subject you to their power, and they'll use all kinds of things, right? So, let's just say using a document, right? And you know that language. To your point, we've been steeped in for so long that you kind of assume that it's true. And when somebody comes along like you and says, "Hang on a second, what does it really mean to have an inalienable right? What is this idea of you are given these rights by a creator and that we would fashion a document that would help delineate and define how we would live in a way that is for the betterment of our life, liberty, happiness, those type of things. And it's interesting to think that something which seems so obvious, yeah, who created this document? Well, why did we create it? You know, and if you think about the, the core reason, you know, you think about after the Revolutionary War and you think about what a unique time it was in human history and where people had come from. Right. And you think about the monarchy and you think about even why people came to the new world that, you know, that general freedom of, you know, expression and worship and all of those things combined with thinking of the day to say, what if we were to animate this in a different way? What if yeah. we were to approach this in a different way? And I think it's, it's, it has really good applications for today because here we are thinking about the money. You know, we're thinking about the money in a way because it is true that you can find yourself in jail. You can find yourself unjustly detained. You can find yourself subjected to something even if you do see it for what it is. Right? Even Paul found himself in those circumstances. So what is one to do? You know, let's say we, we recognize this. We go, okay, let's just use Texas as an example. All right. You know, people often refer to Article 1, Section 2 of the Texas Constitution, that all political power resides in the people, which is a reinforcement of this idea that we created it. It is an extension of our decision making. It is under our authority that it exists. And we reserved in that. We made sure it was clear that there may come a time when we need to abolish or change this. Well, let's say the political winds of force and people are, have been lulled to sleep and there's really no interest, you know? And when I first got into this whole Texas thing, buddy of mine said, dude, there's no way that this is going to happen unless there are people in the streets. And I said, you may be right. It seems like also it's been articulated that people are more willing to suffer than to change. So what does one do that understands this truth, right? And understands, okay, this is not, I'm not under its authority. It is under mine. But we understand that it's not just Steve's decision that we abolish the Constitution. What is one to do in this situation when it comes to this right-side-up thinking in an upside-down world? Yeah, great question. Um couple of examples that, um, that come to mind. Uh, the, the first one is the, one, of, one of the great stratagems that darkness uses is to deflect our attention away from what is true and our response to it, to the delusion of the macro view. In other words, if I look at the macro, all of these people, and I go, oh, wow, that's too big of a job to tackle, then what happens is I neutralize my own 
authority and power willingly. I voluntarily put it on the put it on the shelf. I voluntarily subordinate my authority to the greater challenge and so render myself inoperable. I have now been neutralized. Instead of saying, uh, wait a minute, if I can see this, then certainly there are others who can see this. So the way it was described in now I have a matter of choice. So the way it was described that, that Joshua described it to, um, to the Israelites after they had, you know, completed the conquest of, you know, the promised land, um, at least the first stage of it. He said, listen, guys, you have a choice to make. You can serve the gods, the Elohims of the land that you came from that really aren't Elohim at all. They're just posing as Elohim. Or you can serve Jehovah, the most high of the Elohim. The choice is yours. So choose you this day whom you will serve. Mm. Now that was an individual choice. Yeah. It was an okay, okay, Israel, all the eyes, you know, for the, you know, for the, the Elohim that aren't Elohim in the, in the land you came from, all those in favor of serving them say I, all those who, you know, you know, it wasn't a collective vote. It was an individual vote. It was a declaration of your standing and your understanding of your standing in that situation. I have been granted the authority to declare whom I will serve. Nobody else gets to do that for me. Nobody else can do that for me. I alone must make that choice. And in my making it, I must declare it to be so and then stand in that choice. So the first thing is, it's an individual thing. Don't be distracted by the masses. The masses don't count. It's the rendering of your choice as to whom you will serve. What's fascinating in that example is there was not a third choice offered. In other words, there wasn't a choice to serve yourself. Uh. You didn't say, okay, boys, there, there's three choices here. You know, cho choose the Elohim and the land that you came from that really aren't Elohim. Serve Jehovah, most high of the Elohim, or, hey, by the way, you can always serve yourself. No, that was, that third one wasn't there. You're going to serve one of two spiritual choices. We don't see it that way. A lot of us deny that to be true, and yet we're, the evidence of it is everywhere around us. Can I make a, okay, here's an observation. This is, this is really interesting. So I ask you about something that, you know, starts out as something political, right? It starts out as a document. We talk about this. And what I love is your answer is actually you go way, way to the top of the hierarchy. And I think this is really interesting. And tell me if I'm catching you, catching what you're throwing down, Steve. <laughs> One of the things that's interesting is you said it many times that when you say to Jesus and you say, only you, you are the only one who has the authority to speak to me. What you're doing is you're saying, I will serve you and you alone. Yeah. And what's interesting about it is you, you said to me, I think in a private conversation, you said, all of heaven rejoices. Yes. And what I just captured from what you just said was, don't underestimate the power and the might and the glory of all heaven rejoicing over one. Yes, right on. That's what I hear you saying, because what you're saying is, in this world that is upside down, we think all is lost, but the choice is yours and yours alone. You can't make it for Steve or for me. And the question is, everything starts at home, right? It starts here. Yeah. And 
you think you, you made a really good point the other day too. You're saying, you know, we get all wrapped up in, well, what's the world going to do? What's the nation going to do? What's the state going to do? No. What are you going to do? Yeah. And it's interesting you say that is that it's one decision away from going right side up. That is exactly right. Nat. I mean, uh, Matt, that is exactly right because the, And by the way, for those who who have been raised in the church, there's all kinds of stories around it. If any two of you agree as touching anything in my name, it shall be given to you by my Father in heaven. Well, when you say, declare, I for one will serve you alone, Jesus, guess what? Now you have two. Whatever there are two. Okay. okay. Well, isn't that exactly what happened in with Sodom? Jehovah pulls Abraham aside and says, Hey, hey, bud, I'm about to level Sodom. They have gotten just way too gnarly. And Abraham says, Hey, yeah, but wait a minute, man. Uh, you know, my nephew's there a lot and, you know, his family and stuff. And, hey, you know, yeah, yeah, well, we'll, we'll get him out of there. No problem. Well, yeah, but, you know, <laughs> surely you're not going to, you're not going to, you know, trash all these people. What if there are 10? that are okay, that are interested in being aligned with you? Would you preserve them? Uh. And you know what happened was, it's, it, it began with, you know, one. What if there's one? Well, what if there's two? What if there are 10, five? What if there are 10? And what did the one man, Abraham, do in his conversation with Jehovah about Sodom. He said, listen, go ahead, contend for your fellow man with me. Uh. I welcome it. Oh, now all of a sudden we're back to building the temple of God's man. Who will stand and contend where any two of you agree is touching anything in the authority of my name, character, and nature, the Father will grant it. Well, anybody out there takers? Yeah. Any takers out there? I'm telling you, this thing could be changed literally in a month if we actually came into the realization of our, of our place, our position, our authority as the Elohim of God. You know, that that concept it, it the illustration in my mind is one of standing in the gap right yeah. making an appeal and having this discussion for for others and it's interesting it, it, this is really interesting because it's not what i expected you to say hmm. but i love it because it's counterintuitive and it's so true right it resonates as true and you know what it, it requires of you and this is a challenge that i've been having recently is we're so in the world right? And there's certain ways things are done, right? And I mean, just the basic stuff. And we get into a routine. And I think a lot of times just in that routine, we're not in, we're not considering, we're not considering how it all fits together. And what you're saying is, and I think this is something that's hard for many. I mean, I was on a conference call this morning where everybody's trying to do planning, right? And I said, I don't disagree with the plan. I, I don't disagree that these things are potentially necessary at some point. But we're not at that point yet. And it's really hard for people that don't see the path yet, and you don't have the partner yet, and it hasn't come to pass yet, and you want to force it, right? You want to, well, we've got to do something. We can't just wait. And what... What I'm seeing out of all of this stuff is that, hold on a second, you and I, what a great story, 
what a great story of contending for the people. Yeah. Right. Because, you know, if you're to believe what you just said, that if there are two or more, you know, well, have there been folks throughout history and currently who are standing in that existing gap and contending for God's man? Yeah. And it's interesting, you know, you think about that is the real. We talked about partnership, you know, a number of episodes ago and this. We talked about the ark and carrying the ark and not putting your hand to the ark. And it's really interesting because it's a mystery to me, right? I, I'm not, I, it's very difficult for me to predict God's movements, right? Because he's out front and he does this work. But it's almost like this discipline to say, no, 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 don't put your hand to it. Don't put your hand to it. Because it's, um, it's an interesting place to, to be in, to not know the future, but to believe that he is a shepherd. He's out front. We recognize his voice and there's a time and a place for all things. And it's his appointed time and it's his work because I get so caught up in the fact of what should we do, Steve? And what I hear you saying is, hang on a second, when you're rightly related to him, well, what is it? Where does the rest come from? Yeah. Well, you're given a role, carry the pole, bro. Yeah. Don't put your hand to it. And it's hard, Steve. We're like used to action. Yeah. And how interesting is it as, as we come together in this understanding of saying, have you, what decision have you made? Who have you just de determined that you will follow? And, you know, and what I keep thinking about is money. You know, this, these stories, you can't serve God and money. Well, it's just one other thing. Add another thing to the list that you can't serve God and. Yeah. It's just another thing, right? And this interesting thing of, giving up one's authority to the one who has ultimate authority versus to those who have no authority. Yeah. It's like he's accumulating. And, and what a, an amazing thing you see so many times when people, Jesus is amazed by their faith. I just love when she touches the hem of his garment and she's like, if I just touch the hem of his garment and to think that What significantly can move? And that's what I'm hearing from you, because I don't think I related to things this way, that what is the impact of two or more of us who have chosen this? Well, it's an acknowledgement that it's not by our hand it comes to pass. It's not our effort. Even though there is this interesting Elohim relationship, It's it's an ele it feels like an element of letting go. Am I catching it right? Am I seeing it correctly? Yes, it's fascinating because you are you are letting go of one thing and aggressively laying hold of another. It's that concept is is throughout the New Testament, by the way. Um, this, you know, uh, the whole word translated "have" or "hold" actually means to aggressively lay hold of you know, and, and seize it. Um, in the parable that we've talked about, about the man, you know, the nobleman who goes to, in the, the translation say, receive a kingdom for himself. That word receive actually means to go contend and to lay aggressively lay hold of a kingdom. So there's a partnership. That's a partnership picture. It's not that, oh, he sits back and now it's given to him and now he's, you know, not. No, no, it's partnership. I was talking with some folks on Wednesday evening and, and a gentleman was talking, you know, quite sincerely about, oh, whenever, whenever Jesus has me, you know, pray for somebody and if they're healed, it's not me healing them. It's Jesus. I don't have any real part in that. It's just, and, it, you know, that sounds really good. Mm -hmm. And I asked him, I said, well, huh. And I went back to our discussions about, you know, the ark and the, you know, and how it was transported. And I said, oh, let's talk about the ark. The ark of the covenant was, was the repository of, of the presence and power of Jehovah. And it held some of the artifacts that bore witness 
to his presence and power? How was that ark to be transported? He said, oh, on the shoulders of the priests who had pulled this up. Okay. So if it was set down and the priests were not there carrying it, how mobile was the ark? Didn't float. No. He said, well, it wasn't. I said, how far would it get? He said, well, I guess it wouldn't. I said, yeah, well, see what we, all of those things sounds good, sound good, but we are the mechanism of transport. See, that's the partnership part of it. The, we are the mechanism of transport. All right? Listen, Adam, I need you to name all of, the, all of the creatures that I have created to reside on planet Earth. I need you to do that. So guess what? So Jehovah brought all the animals to him and all the creatures to him. And then it said, and then he sat back to see what he would name them. Why? Was he setting his hand to the work? No, he was partnering in the work. Yeah. When and he what was, was given he that work to do. Yeah. yeah. He was giving transport to the will of Jehovah to have all the creatures not only named, but in their naming become subordinate to the man that Jehovah had created to rule the earth with him. Through naming rights. Not through the naming rights. Wow, you're a good student. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying, man. <laughs> yeah. Isn't the, that what, fascinating? It is amazing. It is. You know what's so neat about this is, you know, we kind of, we, we, we dive into this with some, well, really without a plan. I mean, we talk about it ahead, but it's amazing where the Lord leads it because yeah. The depths of this, you said at the beginning, what a great intro, this idea of the truth, right? And you can, the neat thing about the truth is you can keep probing it. Yeah. And that's exactly what we're doing right now. We're saying on, oh, what does this actually mean? As you continue to probe, it becomes more true. Yes. And it's really, you know, it's really neat about that. I mean, just think about science and, you know, how people will, you know, we thought the smallest thing was an atom, you know, mm -hmm. and then it's like, no, well, we know that there are these leptons and quarks and all these other things. And it's like, now we're going to smash things together. And, oh, there's the Higgs boson. And it's like, well, now things like disappear and appear. And now we got string theory or now we've got. And it's amazing that the deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper we get into it, the more and more order we see, or in this case, the mystery that we see in all of it. And it's funny how it, it kind of loops back on itself. I think the powerful thing, you know, that's resonating with me in this whole story and really this whole is, you know, have you dealt with yourself? Because so many people are trying to, if you will, influence others, yeah. right? They're trying to convince or whatever. And it's interesting, this idea of resting in your own decision of who you're going to follow. And I, you know, I've, I've brought it up many, many times that I didn't realize this self-control of listening to oneself that actually I was inviting in, if you will, not just darkness, but distraction Yes. because I was not, and there was a certain discipline around going, what does it mean to articulate only you have the authority to speak to me? And Steve, it was really incredible. I had a, a call with someone else, right? This neat how these things get passed along. And I was talking with a woman who was really, really struggling and was struggling with trauma mm -hmm. and had health issues because of it and all of this. And just, you know, in the nature, in the conversation, I just said, you know, it's been really helpful to me over the last eight months. <laughs> it's just like, I said, yeah, I've been, I've been just hanging out with a guy named Steve. And one of the things he said, which just, has really been transformational to me is my intent to only give permission, right? Cause we were having this conversation about, well, how do I make these decisions and be careful, don't trip and fall and be cautious. And you never know who, what their intent is. And you know, the, the, they could be serving the evil one, you know, all of these conversations around, Oh no, almost as if I could trip and fall into the pit of despair. 
And I said to her, you know, and of course, this was creating a tremendous amount of anxiety for her. And I said, you know, what's been amazing to me is this idea that I have I've made a, a declaration literally to say only you have authority, only you have permission to speak to me. I will not listen to any other. And of course, how does that manifest itself day to day? Well, I mean, I, I start seeing things for what they are. I recognize that those other voices are not and they are absent of authority. Yeah. It's interesting, right? It's like you, you've said it many times. When, once you see it, you can't unsee it. And I'm not saying it's, you know, I'm, I'm doing a perfect job. But there is something about that. And it's interesting how there are some people who would just distill that down within the church and say, well, that's kind of like salvation. You know, it's kind of this idea of like when you fully commit yourself to Jesus and you say, only you. I'm only going to listen to you. I'm, you know you know, being in Christ and these type of, you know, churchy terminology. But the practical nature of it is, yeah, I'm really interested because I recognize that you are the way. Yeah. And what's interesting is what's the fruit that comes from that? Well, peace in the midst of a storm. And it's, no, I'm not saying that I, I stay disconnected, but I still challenge with this. I agree with you and I, I recognize what you're saying about yeah, there's a partnership, and we are the transport, and it's a really cool concept, the conduit, the the branch on the vine. But there's also this, and this is one of the things I wanted to talk to you about today, was this idea of God's timing yeah. and our timing, yeah, and our planning and his planning. And of course, you know, when you think about this, you're like, well, what? how did the ark move? Well, they were given a role. All right, what's your role? Well, you carry the pole. Okay. I think for me, you know, I recognize that I've got some free will choices to make, right? Ray and I had lunch today, and we chose where we went. I didn't say, Jesus, where should we go to eat lunch? Although I probably could have asked him. Yeah. But he was fine with where we went. Yeah. It was tasty. But the question ultimately, is what is that point? How do you discern, right? You know, I, I look at my own life and I go, I'm really driven by this calling to unlock global generosity, and I see how it kind of fits in and all these things in my life. But it's not like step one, step two, step three. It It, it is, it moves in a, a general direction, but then there are very clear points where it's like, oh, hang on a second, pay attention to this. He doesn't function the way I function, Right. I want to know right now exactly what needs to be done. How how does one deal with what oftentimes can seem somewhat ambiguity have ambiguity to it because the timing is off? I want everything now, Steve. I yeah. want the new economic order. I want the captives to be free. I want to see, you know, you know, Babylon burn in an hour. I want to see the new the new order. I want to see the transfer. I want to see the kingdom come. Yeah. But, you know, I recognize that I'm not the one that decides that. I anticipate it. So is that just the, the nature of a daily bread? Is that the nature of, hey, walk this out with him in his time, recognize that he's out front, he's strategic? Is it patience? Is it? Yes, it's, it, it is all of those Um but it's also part of the growing and maturing process in learning how to understand and recognize how God has created the universe to work in our particular area, in the physical universe, but then also the contribution and partnership that occurs in the, in the spiritual universe. Um, there is a partnership that exists there. And <clears throat> so the question is, is the farmer who is an expert at farming, is he patient because he's waiting for the crop to grow? Yeah. No, he's not patient. He just understands the process. See, he understands how it works the timing of it, what needs to be done. He understands from the beginning to the end how the process works. And so he's not patient. He's just participating in the process. He's at peace 
with what the process yields. It's not a matter of him being patient. So we have things like um, Jehovah telling Isaiah that, hey, my word goes forth and it's like a seed that is planted and it will accomplish the purpose for which I sent it and it will not return to me void. It will actually do the very thing that I sent it to do. And by the way, if you want to know how that works, it's like a seed. Well, what happens with the seed? Well, what we know is that the ground is prepared to receive it. It receives the seed. It appears to die, but in its dying, it becomes alive to the extent that it is capable of producing something that if you opened up that seed, you can never see inside of it what it's a actually able to produce. And it produces this massive structure in comparison to the seed that then is able to produce a massive amount of itself in response. Jesus described it in the parable form first, you know, first the blade, then the head and the grain. Then when the grain is ready to deliver itself over for the harvest, it presents itself. And it, there's this picture of the, of the, of in that particular instance, like the wheat or the corn, actually presenting itself for harvest. It's telling the, uh, the farmer, I'm now ready for the harvest. I'm now ready. The farmer doesn't make that determination. The mature, the, the mature result and produce of the seed tells when it's ready to be harvested. And the farmer isn't considered patient. He just is considered cooperative and an expert in how the system of farming works. So, that's part of getting to understand the nature of the system, the wow. process, how it works. You know, you, you know, it's, you know, you think about, I've been, I've been listening and paying attention to you for quite some time now. And this is an amazing, this is an amazing picture. The seed is such a great, I mean, wow. It's so powerful to think. And I don't know how many people have thought about it that way. You know, I think about having children, you know, I remember my, my first daughter taking her home. I'm like, are you sure I'm allowed to take this child home? <laughs> and if you think about a child as a seed or yourself as one, right, you know, this purpose and what it will become, right? And of course, you know, when you've got a little baby at home, you're like, I wonder what this one will become. And of course, I see her now. She's a senior in high school, you know, and you make a really good point, and, by the way. What's that? I said you have a beautiful family, by the I way. I know. They are just... Hey, <laughs> I uh, Even a blind squirrel finds a nut once in a while. <laughs> it's um, it's amazing, though. So let me let me say this back to you, because I think that this is really powerful. It, I just know it is. Is You know, the farming analogy works, because you're right. The farmer has seen harvest to harvest. And what I think is really cool about this is you're, you're equating the nature of because they're they're connected but why don't we apply the same process to the spiritual okay. so here's the farmer who maybe learned from his daddy that we take this seed at this time of year we till the ground we plant this up you know and there is a there's a season to these things and times and harvest and all of that when I think about my ex church experience, right, and the idea of, well, I read the Bible, and, you know, wow, these are really interesting things. And, of course, the more I dive into them, the more I understand. And then I have conversations with you, and I understand more. Um, but now it, it, it really shows me every question that you've ever asked, or at least that I've seen that you've asked over the years, have been either Jesus asking you, hey, what do you mean by that? Because he wants you to understand how it's structured. 
Yeah. Well, the, the, the farmer understands the structure. That's why he's not patient, to your point. But what's interesting is, you know, I look at the Reformation, you know, hey, it doesn't say this. Why are you doing this? The same thing is true here is to think that if Jesus is alive and he speaks, what do you think he's going to say? And it sounds like to me what he says is, let me tell you the order and the nature and the character that I have put into this thing. And if you understood how it works, you would understand how it works. And one of the things I think is incredible is one of the first questions you ever asked me, which was, did it surprise God that the serpent was in the garden? And you think about that in, the, in terms of each seed that's created. Well, the serpent was created by, by God, right? Yeah. And if you think about it, so, so were the fallen angels allowed to fall. And the question is, you said everything that's been created will fulfill its purpose. So we even talked about darkness having its purpose. Yeah. And that's really interesting to think. Have I don't think we've been told the first step or way in which we can ask and engage the creator of all things. What did you mean by that? Because I feel like I hear you say that so much. Hey, no. what, how do you see this? What do you mean by that? What am I, how am I supposed to see this? No. Because I do think the re result of him speaking that and showing you is you, you rest. Well, what is kind of rest? But yeah, I, I can be more patient because I understand you got all of this under control. And we talk about God's sovereignty. And we're like, yeah, he's got it all under control. I think it's lip service to something that actually he has under control. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he, he definitely does. <clears throat> It's not a surprise to him. No, and it's okay. Let me get let me give you an example. And if you want to go into the more technical nature of time and how it works, well, let's do that. Okay, let's let's start there. Okay. So now we look at the farmer and we get a picture of of one who understands and then cooperates with the system and structure that has been put in place in order to gain benefit both for himself and others. Because that's what it is. You know, you cooperate with the structure yep. and it produces a benefit and that benefit helps you as the farmer and then those around you that need help. Yep. And then you see in the structure of Jehovah's economy that he spoke through Moses and a portion of that you're supposed to take and put in the town in the storehouses in the towns so that anyone who has need for food can go there and, uh, and generously and abundantly take whatever they need to provide for them. So not only is there enough for the farmer and his family, and those who are around him and all the workers that help them and their families and the and to contribute to the overall economy of the lo the local economy and then the national economy there is also an abundance to be able to help anyone whether it's a neighbor or it's an alien who comes traipsing through your land if they are hungry they can go to the storehouse and take abundantly so that they will observe the generosity of your God. That's what the seed is all about. That's what cooperating and participating in the structure is all about. It is full of abundance for virtually everybody who comes in contact with it. And for the one who walks in truth, there's no intention to exploit that. The one who walks in falsehood is looking at it as an opportunity to exploit and control. So that's the macro picture that we see through in the form of the, of the farmer. So now let's look at this thing that you started with called time. In time is a construct of the creation. Okay. And there are three basic elements to it. Um, they're described, um, I'll use the, uh, the way that they are described in the New Testament. One is aeon. Aeon speaks of 
a period of time that is marked by certain characteristics and is, and, and is put in place to achieve a particular outcome assigned to that time. And so when we read, for example, um, in the scriptures, eternal life, um, the word is actually um, aeons, meaning that there is age-long aeons, that these things continue to, to go. And it speaks more of a quality of that time than it does the duration of that time, because the duration is... Um, is assumed. The second part of the time, part of time is called chronos time. Chronos time is linear time. It's what we see happening on, on, a, on a calendar or, um, or on a watch. It's one second um, preceding another second another second, another second. It's very linear in time. The third kind of time is karyos time. Um, those are the three components and karyos time is circular time. Let me finish that, is circular time that speaks of certain characteristics that mark that circular period. Now those three elements in time then produce a fourth element and that's called the fullness of time. So what happens is when linear time and circular time, so chronos time and karyos time intersect, then you have the fullness of time. So you have comments like Paul speaks of in the Galatians when he says, and in the fullness of time, Christ came. Karyos time, circular time, had, and the characteristics that were within it intersected with Kronos time within the context of the Aeon time. And that's when Christ came. So what those, those are the components of time that were created. So what is the purpose of time? The purpose of time is to choreograph circumstances, events, and resources to accomplish the divine decree that was issued before time began. See, we use phrases like before time began. Well, if, if it, what was before time began? What was happening then? Okay. Well, what was happening is these things are being constructed. All right, they were being designed, the plan you were talking about earlier, the plan of God versus our plan. The plan was being, was put together, was documented. So when, when the fullness of time comes, it's a, it is a demonstration of time choreographing every element, every event, every resource to accomplish the divine decree, which was established before time even began. So what am I saying in all of that? That the purpose of time is to manifest a decree of God, a decree that he issued before time even began. So now if we understand that, oh, that's exactly what's happening with the farmer. See, there is a divine decree. The seed will produce after itself in abundance. And so what does time do? Time choreographs the event of identifying a fertile ground that some man identifies and says, oh, I'll bet that there's a lot of weeds out there. If there's a lot of weeds, that means that ground must be pretty daggone fertile. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to exercise what I was created to do before time even began that I didn't even know happened. And I'm going to clear out that land and I'm going to prepare the soil and I'm going to stick a bunch of seed in there. And instead of something 
that only cows can eat, I'm going to grow something that I can eat. And if it does, and if it grows abundantly, then what I'll do is I'll then make that available to other folks. And maybe I can convert that into cash. Okay. Guess what we're observing? Time choreographing events to accomplish a divine decree that God's man would be served through the, through the produce that the ground would create through the seed. Okay? We call it bread. You know, In fact, we even identify money as bread. Why? Because what does money do? You don't chew on a dollar bill. What you do is you exchange it for bread, for something you can chew on. It's the do re mi, man. Yeah, right, right. See, so so that is how what time does. So when you recognize that time is there to choreograph events, what's the last thing you want to do? You don't want to pick the apple before it's ripe enough to be consumed. You can do it. Yep. See, you have the prerogative of authority to do that. But what it is, it is a perversion of your authority and the power that you've been given. And so what ends up happening in your, per, in your um, premature plucking of that apple, you are actually promoting something that's toxic as opposed to something that's abundant in giving life. Just through the misappropriation, premature exercise of your authority and power, your stewardship. So now what does that look like in a, in a business? The mature business leader looks at that, having the experience to see and says, yeah, we could certainly do that, but if we do that, this will happen. And, the, and what is he or she describing? A perverse outcome because of a premature action. Yep, fully capable of exercising that. And those who are less mature in understanding that, what do they do? Well, if they respect the aged farmer, the mature, wise farmer, they yield and learn. If they don't, they'll rebel, they'll bellyache, they'll start creating the very toxicity in the environment that they would produce through the premature exercise of their authority. Why? Because the time is not right. Time has not created a fullness yet to where whatever you're intending to do, the seed has presented itself as it's time to harvest. In other words, to act appropriately, to gain the benefit that, you, that your entire exercise of effort has been designed to produce. So that's the purpose for time. That's what time does. It actually has a role to play. So why in the world would we circumvent time in the accomplishment of its purpose instead of cooperating with it? If the farmer does that, we spit the, we spit the apple out. If the farmer cooperates, what do we do? We go back to buy more apples. Okay? It's the wise, practical exercise of, of cooperating with time as it orchestrates and choreographs events to accomplish the divine decree. By the way, we see that in Peter's discussion with the people who crucified Jesus. We see Jesus doing it in the garden and then in his, when he stood before Pilate, you know? Pilate, man, you think, you think you're the man here, but let me tell you what. You would have no authority over me if the Father hadn't first given it to you. So, man, I, my suggestion is you, wonder, you would probably, should probably wonder why he's giving you this authority right about now. Because huh. something's about to go down. What's going down? The fullness of time, Christ came. Okay. I'm here. The very reason I'm here, you should be paying attention to, because things are about to change. Time has choreographed events to bring about this very moment in time, and now it is full. We're now in, into that 
we're now in another one of those time elements right now. It's called yeah. the transfer we've talked about. We're, we're in another one. Well, yeah, there's a lot of things I'd like to see. I'd like to see all, everything happen in 24 hours, but no, I'm not getting in the way of time doing its work. It's a master at bringing everything together that needs to be done in order to accomplish the divine decree. So that's part of it. Well, there seems to be... Okay, so let's let's take it down to a very like personal practical level. You know, I've I've been known to procrastinate. And I think about just the things that I know I should be doing, right? We talked at the very beginning of all of this that there's that Jesus is alive and he speaks. Yeah. And I was saying, you know what's so wonderful is I can literally ask him, hey, what did I forget? And he'll tell me. I'm like, yeah. And it's like, where do those, where does that reminder come from? Well, I'm gonna say Jesus helps me, right? <laughs> when I when I'm like, hey, what do, what have I forgotten? What do I need? And I and I think in terms of all right. So when it comes to the practical everyday, when you when you say, okay, if I understand the nature of how the the seasons work, yeah, right, and time works, often it it represents a, it represents itself as patience, right? I remember we were in at, at Gen Con, and I said, I was like, man, you are so patient, man. And of course, you know, I think about well, why? Well, what is I'm perceiving as patience is you letting and allowing time to function. Yes. And of course, you see this in the world too, right? It, and I think that everyone that, that kind of goes, you know, why am I here? What's the purpose for my life? And what am I doing? I think many of us have seen there's been a time where you go, this was like, now is the time to act. You know, and I felt that myself that, you know, there are certain times where you kind of do what you want to do, right? I mean, sometimes you, you do have to take some time out and sometimes, you know, cause I'm always, you know, driven to go, am I actually working? Am I actually doing something that is valuable? And what's really amazing is I've got this weird creative thing that I have to do or I do not feel fulfilled. And it's mm -hmm. sometimes it's, silly sometimes it's carving wood sometimes it's drawing sometimes it's making something that has no real real value but it's just this essence of but when it comes to you know holding each thought captive it seems like to me what we're getting at and what i feel like is am i actively aware and partnering with the one who created it all moment by moment, because then it feels like no moment is lost and there's not a thing as procrastination. If in fact I am attentive to that, but it is a really interesting professional amateur thing. You talk about getting in the game. There's an element of, of discipline to this, which is to say, um, I want to be a, a wise steward, faithful. I want to, um, partner with you. I want to accomplish what you've created me to do, but I also want to be cognizant of the fact that there is a season and time and fullness of time and all of this. What would you just say to somebody who has the interest and is, is eager? Like, I, I get it, Steve. I'm like, yes, this makes a ton of sense to me. I want to do this, but a, a sense of impatience in the process. What would you say to them? Um, the first thing I, I would do is I would probably suggest that they ask Jesus what how he views impatience. Okay. Because if you're impatient, they're, they're, that is the opposite of patience, right? So what is it that is in me that is causing me to be impatient? It could be a lot of things. Yeah, it could be true. our training. It could be our perspective. It could be, you know, some impulse. Uh, it could be some lack of discipline. It could simply be a lack of understanding. You know, back to the training idea. I've been trained if I'm not actively involved in after, getting after it, you know, it's the whole, you know, I'm, I'm burning daylight. Yeah. 
you know, I'm burning daylight. So man, if I'm burning daylight, um, I'm not getting stuff done. I'm wasting time. Well, see, there is a noble <clears throat> concept there that is totally, um, can totally be exploited to misdirect. Um, can you, so Jesus, how do you see this thing of impatience in me? If, if, if they're really interested in learning how to come into his processes, into his structure, into the order in the chief beginning of time, order, and rank that we've talked about so many times in Genesis 1-1, that, hey, if there's a time, order, and rank, man, it might be a good idea if I got involved in that. I mean, I've told you the story. I think it's been on this stream how uh, – I was consulting uh, at a consulting client who lost their executives. They asked me to come in and take over uh, the chief, chief executive role for a period of time. Um, I put a guy in there as a chief engineer. He watched what, what I was doing in the, uh, he had heard about what I was doing as a consultant. He then got a chance to see it live and in person when I was, you know, running the company. And he called and said, Steve, can I take you to lunch? I said, sure. And first thing he said was very learned guy. I mean, a world-class engineer. This is a guy that was known around the world. I mean, so this dude had some horsepower. And he said, man, I've been watching you. I've been watching you run this company. Um, it's very, very different than anybody else I've, I've seen doing this. I see the results that are happening. Um, can you point me to some book or a group of books where you learned this? And I said, well, are, are you really, you really interested? He said, absolutely. I said, okay. The one who taught me everything you see happening in me and through me in business, his name is Jesus. If you want to know what he has in mind and how he views business, ask him. He'll be happy to tell you. He never took me to lunch again. <laughs> right? Yeah. Now, I don't know if he took me up on it. I'm hoping the reason he didn't take me out to lunch again is because he took me up on it. Yeah. See? Is... But I can tell, you can tell, we can tell others about it, about the structure, about Jesus, uh, about how he designs things. But only he can, can bring it into life in a way that is just, beyond, not only is it beyond fully describing, it is the most exhilarating experience to actually see the genius of how he's created his creation to function. It is mind blowing. It is so profound. You know, it's well, funny. You, you, you mentioned that, you know, this guy, Oliver Anthony had that song, you know, a month or so ago prior to this, you know, he was high drunk, lost just anxiety ridden all these things and of course people were saying to him you know he's getting i want to say he's in his 30s and you know whenever he would go hang out at somebody's house or whatever they'd be like why aren't you doing something with this music thing and of course he was just wrought with anxiety and all these things and he had what he would say is literally a come to jesus moment and it's it's interesting hang on one second sorry about that um, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. So he, he basically talks about this, um, kind of come to Jesus moment that he had and he was on Joe Rogan, right? So here's this guy who's never been exposed to anything. He releases these things. He becomes like the number one on every chart and then the number one podcaster in the world. I mean, talk about what Jesus can do. And he, <laughs> He appeared yesterday or the day before on Joe Rogan's podcast and 
when Joe had been talking about him, he said, yeah, this guy like came to Christ like a month ago or something like that. And next thing you know, he's the number one, you know, number one song. And, and he, it was really interesting to see him say, well, what is the evidence? This, the supernatural power of, and it really goes back to your idea of what are you going to do? Yeah. Not what is somebody else going to do? What's the Texas government going to do? What's the Congress going to do? What's the president going to do? No, what are you going to do? And to see that kind of miraculous evidence, right? Here's the thing. And it's not that, you know, everyone was designed to have a number one song, but it's just more evidence piled upon evidence upon evidence that this, there's real life in that decision. And for me, it was manifested differently, but I would say it was equally as valuable to me. Yes, absolutely. You know what I mean? And you're right. You know, we could talk about it a lot, but that's the thing that I think is so great about our conversations is this, this idea of once you try them on for size, rather than why don't you go get saved? No, 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 no. Hang on a second. No. Do you have any interest? Well, yeah, I've been trying everything, Steve. And you know what? I've tried all, you know, and that's how I operated. And boy, what I was producing wasn't real good. And it created all kinds of trouble and anxiety and all those kind of things. And you think that what started September 10th of 2000 for me, and, you know, five minutes ago, I have an aha revelation about something, right? A new something, right? And it just goes back to your original point. The truth is always the truth. And it continues. You can probe it and probe it and probe it and probe it. And that's the thing that I think is, you know, so many people flippantly talk about what it means to, you know, follow God and what it means to literally listen to the living Jesus. There's so much benefit built in, but it's such an interesting journey that you have the choice to either be a spectator or a participant. Yeah. And that's, I think, the, the, one of the big things that you have helped me see is what does it mean to actually get into the game? Well, part of getting into the game, talking to a professional baseball player, is, well, you have to understand the rules of the game. Yeah, It's hard to play baseball if you don't know which way to run and that use, you know, and what you're supposed to do with the bat. And it's really interesting. I've always been fascinated with the fact that you became a professional baseball player, which so few people have the opportunity to do. And then he uses that discipline in and he redeems that in a way that applies it exactly to you know understanding the rules of this game yeah this much bigger game more consequential game it's not entertainment it's life and what a what a valuable service that is but you've made i feel like you i don't know about single-handedly but you've made jesus more accessible that's how i feel well, I, I appreciate that. And, and the thing that I would, you know, kind of takes me back a little bit is that he's always, I mean, that's exactly what he said. Call to me and I'll answer you. And I will attentively listen to your requests and answer you. Go ahead, call, call to me. I will never leave you nor forsake you. You know, I mean, they're. But so many people have stood in the way of that. I dealt with that this morning of people wanting to get in the middle of everything. And it's amazing to me, you know, and I don't just want to judge everyone, you know, you know, wholesale in in the church. But it's, you know, I, it's almost the absence of dialogue has created this barrier in, in why it's so powerful to have a friendship conversation with you and just wrestle with these things, because it's much, much more effective for my learning, if you will. And I, and I think this uh, discipleship concept of saying, hey, hey, you know, you're constantly saying, hey, ask him yourself. Here's what I've asked him and what I've seen. But you made a really good point. Hey, you can't live in my shoes. You got to ask him yourself. And likely he's going to show you something that's custom tailored for you. That's exciting. I mean, to think that we could align ourselves with the creator of the universe is just like, Really? Yeah. And it's tangible and it has real benefits and it's accessible and you don't have to go through some ritual to have access. 
Well, it kind of goes back to where we started this particular stream, right? What are we doing? We don't have to think anymore. Yeah. We, we, we don't, I mean, we take a step back. We mentioned this, I think, in the last stream a little bit. Take a step back and just look at the planet around us. You know, at night, uh, out through our patio, looking up at the stars in the sky, if you're you know, if you're out in the middle of nowhere, you see just how many stars are up there. It's crazy. And if you're a city boy like me, it literally blows your mind. Yes. How can there be that many holes in the canopy? Man, yeah. that's a lot of, there's a lot of stars up there. It, and so, and just the ability of my body to be able to see it. Who created this mechanism of sight, this capability of hearing, this ability to form sounds, uh, you know, through a mouth that ears can then interpret into who came up with that system? Now, that's a big thinker. And so, huh, I think I'd like to know who that guy is. You know, if if you created all this, certainly you got a purpose for creating it. Do you know that I've not heard in, in the hundreds and hundreds of maybe reaching into thousands of messages for well-meaning Christian preachers, I've not heard one person give an intelligent answer as to why God created I've heard, well, he wanted to have a family. Yeah. You know, I've heard, uh, really? So he wanted to have a family, so he went through this deal? I mean, man, if you're going to judge me for failing and screwing up, man, that was the biggest screw up that ever happened in the garden. How can a guy that knows all that he knows screw up that badly and then create a being who can screw his deal up. Yep. Uh, Something's not right here. Somebody hasn't thought this thing all the way through. And what you're getting at, and I think this is really important for people because you're, you're, uh, you'd have to go way back to, to talk in detail about that conversation. But that to me is is one of the big, big ahas for me is you're going back to the origin of all of this. It's like I look around and I go, somebody had some really some real intent here. There is some there's a purpose behind all of this. And there's not a lot of people that are willing to have that conversation that's so abstract. Like, why do I even like why did I wake up this morning, Steve? Yeah. Like it could have all been over last night. And I had that weird dream I was running out of gas and here I am today. Mm -hmm. And it's like, all right, let's do it again. And then, you know, I think about my dad or I think about those that have passed. I think about all of these things and I go and I drive past a, a, uh, a cemetery and I think about, yeah, who are those people that came before? And, you know, it's really amazing when you start thinking about it to think that, all this was intentionally created this way and allowed to continue. And, you know, I really feel like we're in a time where we're going to be confronted with the creation in its complexity, even more than we have been. And I think there's no more, I, I, this came at the perfect time for me personally hmm. is to say, it's like you you really need to understand how to direct connect because without without having this ability to ask Jesus what what is this how do you see this a lot of things are going to be thrown at you and you know I just think about in revelation this idea of that there will be those who would be deceived that those who would see this thing and they'd say yeah well he's doing all these amazing things clearly he is well how could you be fooled well because 
you've been lied to and you've been told, well, yeah, you certainly you're not going to die. You don't even know what death is. But it's 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 interesting how it does seem like there's a moment of binary. Once you see it, you can't unsee it type of thing. Like there is some momentary thing where you're like, okay, I get it. Okay, that makes sense to me. And then, and then you're seeing it everywhere you go, right? Upside down, right side up. You're seeing it, you're seeing it, you're seeing it. There are many people who have been within the church who haven't seen it in 40 years. Yeah. And it's almost... And is that what Jesus talked about? Is that the lukewarmness? Is that the, you know, this challenge to chase after him, to be disciplined, to get in the game, to to actually consult with him, to ask him to have a relationship with him is, I mean, this is, seems like what he's, what he's desiring from us is, Hey, ask me and I'll tell you. I mean, there seems to be a desire for, in, 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 it seems like it pleases God that we would actually consult with him. What, well, yeah. I mean, it, there is, we see that in the example of the Mount of Transfiguration, you know, Folks, some of you are some of you are not going to die until you actually see how the kingdom works. That's what Jesus said earlier. And then it says, and eight days later, Jesus was with Peter, James, and John on the mount, and they saw him transfigured. Yeah. And you know, Mo and Moses and Elijah uh, appeared with him, and they were conversing. Yeah. Well, what are they talking about? Are they just shooting the bull? I mean, what were, Jesus, what were you talking about with Moses and Elijah? Well, Steve, are you interested? Yes, I am, vitally. <laughs> okay, sit down, because there were about a dozen things going on at one time. Let me start here. This is how my kingdom was designed to work. I partner with my man. And not only do I partner with my with my man who is occupying the earth at the time at the moment, I am working with my man who has already spent his time here and is now working with me in the heavenlies. Heaven and earth are not separated. They are one. Did I not tell you that if you believed you would not see death? Do you see Moses and Elijah dead? That's no. so huge. That's how my kingdom works. As they had a role to play on the planet, so they have a role to play in my heavens, and we are working together to accomplish my father's plan. That's what we are doing. Have you ever heard anyone say those words you just said? No. I've never in my life ever heard anyone say those words you just said. I've never heard of one, but I did hear Jesus. Well, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. No, but that's so, I mean, it's amazing. What you would think that you would share from that story is something completely different. That is, that's never been shared, in my opinion. But what an amazing picture it is. Why was he talking to Moses and Elijah? That's so, what an amazing thing. Because they're not dead. <laughs> that's right. I mean, it seems so, so obvious when you say it. But how amazing. It was. So think about that as hope, right? Now I'm kind of extending this in my own story of hope, right? My brother called me right after my dad died, and he was freaked out. And he said, um, uh, Dad talked to me last night. And I'm like, okay, we, we'd kind of call that like mental illness, probably <laughs> in the practical sense of it. And what my dad said to him was the most amazing thing that I've ever heard. And it was exactly what he needed to hear at that moment. It was just the most beautiful thing. And of course, he was wigged out. Yeah. And, you know, it gives me a lot of hope because I don't see it. Like, I don't hang out with my dad, right? He's gone and I don't see him and I miss him. But to think what you just said is this ultimate promise that I don't think, like, I think we were put here to remind each other of. Like, you're helping remind me this is not all there is. And that's so hopeful. No, 
Yeah, you saw he was talking with them because they have work where they are. And of course, you know, I think I know that to be true because this idea of, well, no, store up your treasures in heaven. Oh, because you use those treasures in heaven? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You may have be responsible for cities. Okay. Okay. I don't understand how all that works, but I'm going to take your word for it. But wow. But see, that's the thing, Steve, that's so interesting about this time is I even ask myself, why do I know Steve? Yeah. I, I do. I'm like, why did I meet you in Dallas? Why have I had this conversation relationship with you? And, and what is it? in preparation of because i really truly believe you're serving me in preparing me for something yes to help me see how it all works but also to say you can ask him yourself and you should ask him yourself but i, I do think that there's you know there's different gifts right there clearly are different gifts and the gift that you've been given which is completely aligned with everything that, you, you know in, in it's evidence that it was designed since the beginning of time. Yeah. Right. Yep. You're still playing those baseball games out back after, you know, and it's like, no, nope, he knew. All right. You're going to, you're going to treat me like you treat baseball. Yeah. And that's so, you know, you think about good and faithful servant. It's amazing though, to me for so long, but you just said it time. Yeah. It's gotta be, and this is kind of in the human question for you. Has it been hard for you? It seems like it would be hard for you when faced with so many people who are so stuck and I think would reject something that to me seems so obvious, but I wasn't raised in the church, right? I, I don't have a bunch of baggage, Steve. And so to me, it makes sense. And, you know, when you say Jesus is alive and he speaks, I'm like, yeah. Yeah, that's the only way it's possible. There's no other option. Yeah. The whole thing points to the fact that he's alive and he speaks, not just on Easter Sunday. But you have I feel like you've gone through so much. Has that been difficult that almost so many people have been, and I don't even know what, what the term would be, blinded? Or what? how would you describe it? Because it sounds like you've battled church folks and you're probably telling them one of the most practical things that they know to be true. They just can't accept that you would say it. Does that make sense? Well, it, it does. And, and by the way, you are demonstrating to the folks on your channel this whole idea of unlocking generosity. What, has, what you have found valuable, you are unlocking it and making it available to other folks. And they are exactly the way I was. They're exactly the way you are. We have to decide if this is something that adds value to us. Yeah. And if it does add value, then go to the one who actually gives the value. You know, and that's the whole, that's the whole message here. Um, and and instead, in the religious context, you are bringing people to a belief system designed around a person instead of taking them to the person. Yeah. 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 And, and that's the difference. And it's a subtle, it, there is a subtle difference that is very, very subtle, but it is profound in its implications and effect. Um, so that we, we, the way Jesus said, you know, about the, you know, the Jewish leaders of his day, you know, you'll go through all kinds of effort to make a proselyte of men from all over the planet. And when you do, and this is how Jesus described it, you make them twice the son of hell as you are. Well, see, that could seem to be a condemning statement. Yeah. Until you say, Jesus, why were you saying that? Were you condemning these people? No, I wasn't condemning them. I was bringing, shedding light for them to see the effect and impact of their approach to life and to me. It's bass backwards. Yeah. You're saving them to a belief system. You're not directing them to the very God that you say you worship and serve. That if you're making them twice the son of hell, 
than you are, then guess where the origin of that belief system is coming from? That you hold true. Well, you don't believe me? Then start probing it and watch what happens. By the way, Jesus is saying, to, that's why you're all pissed off at me, because I'm probing. Yeah. See, you think that, that the Sabbath, um, man was made for the Sabbath. No, that's backwards. The Sabbath was made for man. Thus, man is Lord of the Sabbath. Now, how is that, how, how is that working for you guys? Because that's one of your key doctrinal premises. How's that, how's that playing for you? Well, we want to chop your head off. Okay, then take a look at that and see where that comes from. Is that coming from heaven or is that coming from hell? See? It's there right in front of you to see. You just have to be willing to see. That's all that's necessary. You just have to be interested. If you're interested, I'll take you along and show you so you can see it for what it is. And then you can decide. See? Why decide before you actually see it for what it is? Doesn't seem to me like that's a very wise approach. Why don't you at least venture to see what's actually there? And now you kind of take that into the same, into your question about has it, has it been hard? Um, my wife would probably be a better one to answer than, than I am. <laughs> um, it has had its moments of being pretty hairy. Um, that's for sure. And um, what always ends up happening, Matt, is, the con is this little term called orthodoxy. And if we had any idea where that came from and what it was designed to do and the impact and effect it has on us that we voluntarily give ourselves to, if we understood that, back to the first, would you like to actually see it for what it is? If you're willing to see it for what it is, what you see is you see that that is a very sophisticated mechanism of professing to tell you the truth, when in reality, getting you to, to swallow hook, line, and sinker, a total lie. And the way you know it is you start probing it. You start touching it. And you start saying, oh, wait a minute, is that really what that, what that is all about? Um, and so, yes, it was, um, there have been some pretty hairy times in our lives, um, some really very, very difficult ones. Um, we have been ushered before tribunals. <laughs> I have a friend that, that I don't know if he watches these or not, but he has participated in a couple of these watching me uh, being taken before people to be examined, to have my, my doctrinal premises and, and heresies dealt with and revealed and, you know, realigned. And then I asked him, and so I would just ask him, are you asking me to abandon my heresies to adopt yours? Is that what yeah. this is really about? Is that how this is working? You know, so, but, but in all of it, that is how darkness works. You know, the greatest power, the greatest exhibition and exertion of power is in darkness. Darkness has to function in darkness. Otherwise, it can't function. And that darkness has to be accepted as true. Otherwise, it can't, it would never be accepted. Right. So, its great power is in presenting itself as true while hiding the very reality of its, of its untruthfulness. Because once it would be seen, 
rare is the person who would give themselves to it. If we actually saw it for what it is, we'd say, whoa, 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 wait a minute, hold off, hold off. I'm, I'm, no, I'm not doing that. Are you crazy? That's, that's insane. Why would I do that? Well, what are they saying? They've seen the truth of what is actually there and it's set them free. And how has it set them free? By them exercising their sovereign prerogative to say, no, I'm not going to do that. So darkness, the great power of darkness is to remain hidden. So what are we seeing today? Darkness is being, the, the veil of darkness is being, is being uh, lifted. Yes. We are actually seeing it for what it is in its full and open display. And why are we seeing it? Because it's, its hiddenness is now being, being disintegrating. It's, it is collapsing right before its very, its very eyes. And so we're seeing it ourselves. And you know, the question is, what are you going to do about that? You know, the, in the financial world, there's a book called Flash Boys. And it's a story of the beginning of electronic trading in Wall mm -hmm. Street. It's an amazing story. But one of the things that they highlight is what's called dark pools. Mm -hmm. And in, in trading, you know, what are you trying to do? What does the, what do the Wall Street insiders need? They need a dark pool. Yeah. And you think about, you know, to bring all of this back around to a crypto channel is what is what is the power of the origins of bitcoin and if you read the the original manifestos um it's amazing there was one called um and these are the original cypherpunk guys these are the guys who are into the math of cryptography at the beginning realizing that there was wow if we can if we can use this cryptography and we can apply it to, you know, a system that has no centralized authority, it can be exposed, right? And so one of the things about the blockchain is this idea of transparency and no middlemen and no centralized authority. And what is that? But light being shed on something. You can't hide it. Can't hide. And you're right. The, the powers that have existed, you know, up until now, you think about, just our ability to have this conversation, right? Just the, the technologies that come out, look at Edward Snowden, you know, look at WikiLeaks, look at all of these things that the technologies of the day and now with the money, that the things that were done in darkness, the things that were done to get asymmetric power, the things that were done to accumulate um, and lord over are being exposed. And it's interesting, you know, you think about this as it relates to the church and spiritual type of things is, um, you know, there's a generational thing too, too here, because I think about my grandfather, he was born in 1911, and he saw the Depression. He grew up in the Depression. And then World War II, and the war's over. And they moved to the suburbs and have a bunch of kids. And I remember in college, I was studying the, that era. And one of the things that kept on repeating itself was kids to be, kids are to be seen and not heard. Yeah. I grew up in that. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, my dad was born in 1948 and he said that was the, well, who is he raised by? Depression era parents. You know, this yeah. was a guy who he's like, I've been, do you know how hard it's been for me? Like that's something my grandfather would say, right? You know how hard it has been? Went through the depression, then the war, and now we finally have a moment to breathe. And now I got you damn kids to deal with. Yeah. And I think about that, but that parenting style also, you know, th there's a part of things is we're finally getting a chance to get a leg up and to try to, you know, control this thing. And you're getting in the way. And it's really interesting now that we see the things that were done in the cover of darkness, whether it be killing the president, whether it be killing his brother, whether it be, you know, 
all of these things that were hidden are being exposed. And it's interesting if you think about in those terms, right? Dark and light and the fullness of time. That we're in an era where things are being exposed and that's a good thing. Yes. Yes. And I think a lot of people think, oh no, how bad things are. But you said it many times and I'd love for you to kind of finish up this on this concept of don't let your heart be troubled and don't be fearful. This is the way it is supposed to happen. Meaning these things, all of these things will be exposed. And, you know, there's some things that are coming, Steve, that I can see coming that many people probably aren't as interested in. But I mean, the fact that we've got people in front of the Congress saying, we got stuff that we don't know what they are that are operating in our skies with impunity and, they are not us or they're intelligent or whatever, and we don't know what they are. And, you know, the things that have been hidden and relationships and all the things that have been that darkness is being exposed. Yeah. And I have a feeling that in the next 10 years, we're going to see things that only we've read about in scripture. And we'll see them plainly. And it will be shocking to us because we have gone through this, you know, and I almost feel like my wife's this way. Do not tell me anymore. La, 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 la. You know, it's like, I don't want to know this because yeah. it's like being in the matrix. I don't want this to be exposed, but it, it has to be exposed. And we get to live in this time where the kingdom come that will be done on earth as it is in heaven isn't possible unless all darkness is exposed. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's my sense of it, is that the kingdom of heaven is not a place where darkness reigns. It has to be exposed. And if there's a process or gradient by which it goes from darkness to light, potentially we're in that era or that time. Is that well, yeah. possible? Well, yeah, and here's, here's the question. Um, why is it important for darkness to be exposed? Because it almost sounds like an oxymoron. Um, yeah. How can darkness be exposed? Because if it's darkness, it, it by implication, it it is cannot be exposed. You know, it is the opposite. So why is darkness exposed? What is the purpose for it? Well, quite simply, because what's in darkness is hidden and you can't deal with it when you can't see it. It's kind of the picture of, you know, going into a totally black room and having to try to, you know, function in that totally black room, what's there is already there. When, yeah. But it's very, very difficult to maneuver or to function in any way because there is an absence of light. But the moment you turn the light on, now guess what? It's not the darkness that is exposed. It is the items that are operating within that darkness that are exposed. So what we're seeing is not the exposure of darkness. We're seeing the, ex the exposure of what is happening in darkness. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. And that distinction is really very, very important, you know, for us. You know, I've written some of this in, you know, in the white papers, you know, and in the, the coronavirus white paper in particular, that the, the time that we are in, is the transfer, the kingdoms of the world and all of the sub kingdoms that are operating within them are being transferred from the control of the prince of the power of the air, whom we call Satan in his kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God to be ruled, you know, by Jesus and his man that we are, we are in that time. Now, that drives end time people crazy because it doesn't fit with their with their particular eschatological time frame. But it doesn't matter because their time frame doesn't matter. Back to what you were asking before, our time frame, time, our time versus God's time, God's plan versus our plan. And we're actually observing it. Um, and when that happens, what is at stake? Well, Satan started in the, in the garden. He wants to complete his 
you know, his mission, his all-in mission of gaining control of the material part of God's creation, which is happening through controlling God's man on planet Earth. That's the door that opens to him divine sovereignty equivalent with God. That's what he's doing. Okay? And he is and his effectiveness has been because he's operating in darkness. So he's doing all of these things outside of our purview, outside of our vision, our own personal vision screen, vision capability, because we have been we have been blinded from seeing into that dimension. Well, guess what we are observing? All of a sudden, darkness is being, what's happening in dark, what has been happening in darkness and visible to us, we're now seeing it. And guess what's happening? Satan is being required to move out of time. Now, do you think, do you think those, what we call, extraterrestrials are wanting to be seen? Likely no. not. No, because their effectiveness is in being unseen. The greatest form of power is when somebody does not know that they're being controlled, and yet they give their full permission for being controlled. That's when, that's when darkness ha exerts its greatest power. You don't know I'm using you, and yet you give me permission to use you and everything you got. And you yep. don't even know it's happening. That's darkness. Guess what? Once I realize that that's occurring, darkness is being removed, and I'm seeing what's actually happening. And then I go, oh, wait a minute. I'm not doing that anymore. Well, that's that's the practical application of all of this. I mean, I, I've been seeing that in my own. You know, I, I, I've said it many times. There are no more. Oh, no's. Yeah. And I'm not I'm not a pro at it yet, Steve. I'm, I'm definitely not a pro at it, but I see it when it is happening. And what does it want me to do? I it's this overreaction escalation thing. Yeah. Right. You know, I think a lot of us that are married you know, and I, th I see this across the, the world is that we, a lot of times people will, whether they're truly upset or manufacturing upset, they expect you to be where they are. Yeah. And so you see a lot of um, manufactured crises, right? Well, and some of them are actual crises, but what's interesting is the ones that are real crises has a galvanizing effect. It's, it's, it's strange, actually. When things really are a crisis, it's almost like we're heightened to serve and we are actually more unified. And I've seen that in my own home. It's when things are picking and when things are not serious, but they get overblown. And I find that, you know, I'm a professional overreactor. But almost there are times when that's the expectation. Like, if you're not getting upset, then you don't really understand me. And I've had to be disciplined to say, hold on a second. You know what? There's another way. Yeah. And, you know, that's a perfect illustration of what you just said is that I, I can, you can give me your authority and you can lose all standing in this conversation by overreacting and by escalating and by basically, you know, the things that I feel like in life are very commonly misunderstandings end up becoming such big damaging things yeah. that could have easily been snipped, right? I often say, you know, people are lighting a fuse, right? They got a bomb in their hand, they're lighting the fuse and just asking someone to clip that fuse. And it's like, no, people are blowing on it and adding accelerant to it, you know, <laughs> and, you know, wanting it to explode. And so many things are like that. But, um, this has been really, really interesting. It, it's This is a different stream than we've done in the past because it's, I almost feel like a lot more introspective, but also has amazing implications for the big global story that's happening right now. 
like what we see, you know, we started, we talked about things like, you know, your own personal sovereignty and coming and giving away your authority and coming underneath documents like the constitution. Strangely, I was in church the other day and the, the pastor said, do you come under, or you need to come under the authority of the Bible? Said those actual words, Steve. Oh, and I was it, shocked. It is, a, it is a doctrinal premise in, in a lot of denominations, yes. I was shocked. And I literally was like, hold on a second. And it, like, you know, when you see something, you can't unsee it. And it was really interesting to me. And I didn't have a conversation with the pastor about this, but, you know, I was thinking about this. And we've talked about it many times, but it's really, really fresh for me. I was, I was reflecting on your story you told last week. So mm. many people were so moved by that, right? Mm. You're like, well, what are you going to do? And the kids are like, what Jesus say, Steve? And you're like, well, we're supposed to buy a house, but we only have 20 bucks. And I think about that account, right? And you and I, we could tell fun stories. So many cool stories of what Jesus has done, right? And it's amazing, miraculous. You're like, I don't know how that worked out, but boy, it worked out and it was amazing. And what a great story to tell. Is that true? Is that a true story? Well, yeah, it's a true story. Is that is that story scripture? Did you write it down in the book of Steve? No, you told it to me. And I went, you know what? Boy, our God is good, isn't he? Yeah. And then I think about this pastor saying, you need to come under the authority of the Bible. And I was like, we have inserted a book in the place of a living man, God himself. Yeah. And it's shocking to me that we're okay with that and we don't step up and say, hang on a second. Are we talking about the same book? Are we talking about the same thing? And that's the thing, you know, I thought if I really wanted to draw people off sides, which is not a wise thing to do, Steve, I've mm -hmm. learned that. You know what I would say? I would say the Bible is not the word of God. Yeah. And it, people would lose their beep. Yeah. Yep. And I said, well, and I, it is... It is a word of God. Yeah. And I think about that for a second. It's like, whoa, hold on a second. Be careful what you say. I think what's amazing about that idea is that in that is a picture of everything. Yes. Is that what is this lie? I'm going to get you to come underneath the authority of really something that's the manifestation of a technology called the printing press. Yeah. And when you think about this, if, if it was meant to be an authority over you, he would have only said it once. Yeah. But what I love about the stories and the parables and acts and the, the proverbs and all of the, the 66 books that we at least consider in this canon is that they tell the same story over and over and over again. Why? Because they were originally told to each other verbally. Yes. We did not have this book in every home. And when you think about it, could you imagine telling someone before 1444 that they needed to come underneath the authority of the Bible? They're like, what's a Bible? Yeah. You think about that. The actual term Bible did not exist. Yeah. And I don't know. They say you need to come under the authority of the papyrus, like the paper. Do I need to literally come under the authority of or whatever sheepskin? Yeah. No, 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 no. What is this an account of? This is an account of the living God. And it's like, wow, in those very words is a lie. Yeah. The Bible has been one of the most influential things. But you know what? One of the first verses I ever memorized, Steve, was what? it said, All scripture is God breathed and useful for yeah. teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So the yeah. man of God will be fully equipped for every good work. Yeah. And I think about that. I'm like, well, it says it right there. It's yeah. useful. <laughs> it's really useful. And you know what, Steve? It's been really useful. Yes, it has. It's wonderfully useful. Yes. Wonderfully useful. But what's amazing about it, too, is Ray told me a story one time. And it's just like your story you told me of, of your, your house situation. That story had so much impact because it illustrated something that, that, proved, that was a truth that the Bible talks about, but the way he shared it, because I know him and I know his experience, I got it in a new way. Yeah. It's just like what you talked about earlier. Like, oh, I see it differently when you say, what do you think he was talking to Elijah and Moses about? 
I needed you to say that to me so I would see it anew. Yeah. But I don't have to come under the authority of Steve to have a revelation about who God is. He's alive and he speaks. But, you know, that's the thing. It's like it breaks these things up and you go, hold on a second. Maybe all of these things that I just kind of was born into, like fiat currency, maybe it's not all it's cracked up to be. Maybe I actually should ask the creator of it all what he thinks of it. And yeah. that's really all you've done. All you did was you say, I'm going to just ask him myself. I'm not yeah. going to listen to you. And I think that that's so powerful. And I think it's time has come, right? Because I think what we're going to see is all of these things that you thought were just stories are going to become clear that they're real and that we're going to see heaven and earth become one. We're going to see that the spiritual is real. That's what I think is coming. I think we're going to literally see and get a picture into this realm like that is it's going to shock a lot of people when they realize hold on a second the bible or the scriptures themselves these accounts are true well the one decision away yeah see that that is what terrifies the realm of darkness is that the entire planet is literally one decision away and they can't do anything about it. One decision. Now think about how fragile we, we look at all of that's going on and we think, Oh man, it's going to hell on a hand basket and everything is terrible and things are going to be falling apart. Well, what happens if the stuff that's falling apart needs to fall apart? Yeah. Let it fall apart. Yeah. Don't add energy to it. Don't add any, any, any energy to it. Just let it disintegrate in front of you. Then recognize who you are. Yeah. Take your stand and say no more. No and, more. And, and let's animate the tools in his nature and character. Let's move That's forward true. with him. Well, look what, you know, I'm, I'm going to kind of, brag on you a little bit, you know, to the, you know, to the audience, but Matt, look what's happening to you just in the understanding of the nature of authority as you're dealing with these international parties. Yeah. They, it, there is a, it, it's universes apart and it's not braggadocious. It's not blustering. It's not, you know, arrogant. It's just walking in the simple truth of the grace of God and the humility that is a part of his character, but in the full authority with Jesus. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting about that. The real practical is this morning, players internationally were trying to become middlemen. And it was interesting that I knew it the moment I saw it, the discernment I had, I mean, like... I know the truth. Yeah. And I think what's interesting is so many of us who let's say you don't have experience in big deals. And I've had I've been in some big deals, but this one's probably one of the biggest deals I've ever been in. But I'm not you know, it, I'm not blinded by it, right? It's it's one of these things where it's like, all right, Jesus, you are providing clarity to the the, the the steps in this process and you know what's funny is it, they're trying to pick the fruit off the tree yeah. prematurely and they are trying to in its selfish ambition that is winning or driving the day and you know, i've said no yeah. no you have gotten these things out of order yeah. and it's this impatience that has led them to say we i need to get mine and what's so incredible about this is I'm so thankful for that calling that is continuing to be reinforced of unlocking global generosity by giving and this idea that, no, no, your job is not to put your hand to it. And, and I feel like what the Lord has said to me specifically is you're supposed to give this away. Yeah. And every time I've thought about how I'm going to win, he's like, slap my hand. He's like, no, no, <laughs> no it's not about you. Yeah. It's about what I'm doing. Yes. And, and in a way, it's purity. Like, I know that if I put my hand to it, I, I add death to the situation. Like, it has to be pure or it can't be anything. 
It, it has the, to stop others. Tell me the impact that that has had on you in terms of the importance of what you're doing. Well, in, in some way, it becomes obvious that it is the truth. It's the right way, right? It, it just it, elevates it. It is, yeah. It just is the right yeah. way. And it's almost as if it's frustrating to some people, right? It's frustrating to people who, what do you mean we need to wait? Yeah. You know, like for example, one of the things that's required in this big, big, big deal is having the right partner. And some people are frustrated because they're like, I want to force this partner to work. I'm like, and I told them, I said, if you have to convince them, they're not the right partner. Yeah. The right partner will know when they hear it. Yeah. Your job is just to tell the story. The right person will say, ah, I get it. I understand it. But we, it's a partnership. It's not a sale. Yeah. And right that's on. so many people want it to be a sale. I've got a program. No, no, this isn't a program. This isn't a product that you purchase. This is a partnership that ultimately leads to a, a transformation. However, it's not our transformation to transform. He's, he's shown us the way in the path, but it's like we have to wait for it to happen. And that's the thing that is, I mean, that's why, I, I mean, I'm still wrestle with it, right? I want everything now. I want everything to happen. I want everything to line up. And it's, it tests you, but it's like, okay, maybe it's good that I've got diabetes and I get kind of tired, <laughs> you know, kind of get worn out easily. It's like, okay. Jesus, Jesus can flip that switch when he needs to give you a little help. Yeah, no, he, he, does. he, does. he does. Here, let's let's get you in the rest mode, Matt. That's right. That's right. Here, I'll have a yeah. minor attack. That's right. Well, folks, um, I think it would be we would be remiss if we didn't um, call out Mike Ostell in yeah. as we wrap up. Um, do you want to give an update on Mike? Yeah, Mike is uh, is at home. I think I mentioned that last week. He had come, uh, had just gotten home. He said he had a little bit of a rough uh, go at it this um, this past week, especially trying to walk and stuff. And, um, you know, for my part, I just assured him, hey, listen, man, you you did not go through any small thing. So um, having a bump here and there is not is not a big deal. The trend line of progress is what's important. So uh, once again, um, he is just so grateful for the support whether spoken or otherwise, he feels it and he gets it yeah. um, from this community. So every week he wants me to give a shout out to everybody and tell them how much he appreciates everyone and uh, looking forward to get back in the saddle. So that's good prog progress, but a little bit, a few bumps along the way. Well, and I know many of the people that are in the chat and I feel like we're all going through something, dealing with something in you know, I, I, I think about David Lee and the challenges that he has and he faces and his wife faces. And, you know, so many people are struggling with so many things. And I think the encouraging thing for me today, Steve, is to say none of this stuff is a surprise to him. Yeah. Right. And. This isn't the end. No. It is merely the beginning. Because if life be eternal, then this experience that we have was actually shortened because ultimately the grace of God. Yeah. And to think that it's hard to imagine that I had less time with my dad or I'll have less time on this earth. And that, that actually that is an act of grace because yeah. real life, we're not actually living real life. No. No. And it's it pales in comparison, but you know the roles that we play in this, whether it be in crypto, whether it be in our families, whether it be, um, it's hard for me to think. Consider it pure joy when facing troubles of many kinds, because I'll tell you, the times that I feel the weakest, I don't always recognize the strength that God has in that. Yeah, and it's a it's a mystery, it's a challenge, but um, it's much easier to do with friends like you, Steve. Well. Thank you for that. And, and I would just pass on, you know, that when we, again, looked at 
Jesus and Moses and Elijah, what they were doing was conferring. Yeah. Jesus was conferring with his partners and his partners were conferring with him. So the invitation is to learn how to confer with him. You know, okay, Jesus, what's this about? What's happening? How are you looking at this? Here's how I'm seeing this. Am I, am I, am I in sync with you? Or, hey, I have no clue what's happening here. What am I missing? See, those, those are, that's the dialogue of one conferring with a confidant. Um, so learning to confer is a big part of what was Jesus was demonstrating, you know, with Moses and Elijah on that mount. Um, and it's an invitation to do the same, to learn to do the same, you know, no matter what the challenge. Yep. Jesus is alive and he speaks. Thanks, yeah. Steve. We okay, did man. it again. All right. Thank episode you. 19 in the books. <laughs> All right, I'll catch you in a minute. Thanks so much, Steve. Happy weekend, everyone. Yeah. All right. Oh, once again. Wow, another two hours and 15 minutes have gone by. You know what's interesting? I was just reflecting on this idea. You know, what is Steve always encouraging me with? He's like, hey, ask him yourself. And, you know, I'm really big on the practical things. And I'm just going to share with you some of the things that, or one of the things that I've done that has been beneficial to me. And that is, I've, I've stopped and I have literally gotten a clean sheet of paper and I've stopped and I've literally, I, I've just literally asked him, you know, only you have the authority to speak to me, speak to me. How do you see this stuff? And it's interesting, like for me, writing, actually writing it down. And it's interesting the things that as I rewrite, reread what I've written, because sometimes it just like, it just pours out. I'm like, I don't even know what I wrote. And then I go back to reread it again, and it's interesting how what kind of affirmation there is. And so much of it is not the lottery numbers, right? He's not like, hey, let me tell you the lottery numbers. Um, he's telling me, you are my son. I love you, right? Trust me, and I'll show you. And it's interesting, you know, for Steve, over this time in this, this you know, relationship where you're like, who do you have friendship or relationship with that you don't talk to is it continues to share more and more and more. And that practice and that reminder of a professional like Steve, it's like encouraging me to go, what does it mean to be a professional? Well, I want to be in the game. I want to be useful, but also want to fulfill the purpose. And it's like, all right, I'm going to choose this. Um, so writing is one way that that I've seen. Um, and, I, and I then have that to go back to, I think is an interesting practice. Um, but anyway. Just uh, I think it's helpful to have people kind of share, well, how do you do it? You know, Steve, do you like, you know, get up and have coffee and sit down and talk? And then, you know, what does he say? It's like breathing. It's not like I set time. But I think that that's the coolest thing about this is that, wow, we have access at all times. And to me, the thing that just like hit me right between the eyes today is what was he talking with? Moses and Elijah about they're alive they're not dead it's amazing folks take care of yourself have a great weekend we will catch you uh probably this weekend or Monday with something else hey we're getting ready for a bull run folks it's getting exciting take care of yourself and do not mess with Texas take care everybody <laughs>